Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar series that we have uh, this afternoon, uh, Thursday, the 24th day of uh, September 2020. Uh, we are looking at inheritance and the succession plan. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Bernice Muya. Uh, Ms. Muya will be helping us uh, discuss whether succession is a success in Kenya. Uh, we commence with the words of the Kenyan national anthem recited in English. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our speaker uh, this afternoon, uh, Banis Muya, is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya uh, with over 18 years standing. She is a certified uh, mediator with MTI uh, having been trained in November 2014. Uh, Ms. Muya is accredited by the Judiciary of Kenya and is also on the FIDA panel of mediators. Uh, she has worked as a practicing advocate for four and a half years uh, before joining the corporate world, where she worked at KWFT as the first uh, legal officer between December 2006 and February 2011. Thereafter, Ms. Moya has worked as the Head of Legal Services in Madison Insurance uh, Company Limited and as Company Secretary at uh, UAP Insurance uh, Company and later as the Group Legal and Regulatory Affairs Manager and later after that, a Company Secretary at FEP Holdings uh, Limited. Uh, Ms. Moya has also worked as the Managing Partner at uh, Simba and uh, Simba Advocates uh, from May 2018 to August 2019. She is currently the proprietor of Bani Smuya and Associate Advocates in Nairobi. And Ms. Moya is extremely passionate about mediation, uh, seeing it as the best alternative uh, to many disputes. Uh, before we engage uh, Ms. Moya, uh, we will have uh, Mohamed Said. Uh, Mohamed Said is uh, one of the young mediators uh, that we have. And uh, Mohamed Said will be able to uh, give us a commentary uh, touching on peace before we go on to the topic uh, for today. Good afternoon, Mohamed. Good afternoon, Mohamed. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, we are looking forward to your commentary. Uh, please proceed. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Sarah and also the presenter advocate, Bernice Muya. It is a wonderful topic and I'm interested to know more about inheritance and succession plan and how the mediation will be will evolve. So before I go into the topic itself, as we know that uh, we, are, we are marking UN Peace World and Wasiliana Hub as uh, Wasiliana Hub mediators as one of the stakeholders, we we'll like to mark this day, uh, the Peace Day for peace, dignity and equality on a healthy planet that we live in. Uh, Peace is a foundation of stability. Peace is the foundation of love. Peace is the foundation of cooperation. Without peace, we cannot do anything. So it's a foundation of every stability that we have. So I will urge all members to pray for stability for our country and the world at large forevermore. So Peace is very vital and we should pray for it. And uh, as Wasiliana Hub, you're marking the Peace Day. 
because it's very important in our life. Now we'd like to continue to the topic of today. My commentary, uh, the topic itself is inheritance and succession plan, is succession on our success in Kenya. Very wonderful topic. And uh, now I'd like to just give a brief uh, process of succession application in Kenya. And uh, the speaker will correct me if I'm wrong anywhere, because just a brief, uh, because I've been I've done some succession application petition in court. So beneficiary first, they need to select an administrator who petitioned the court. And uh, after they have petitioned, there are some documents that are needed. And then we expect uh, the gazettement after the gazettement, the administrator is provided with grant. And the administrator will be the one administering the estate on behalf of the other beneficiaries. And after that, after some time, in accordance to their plan, they make an application for transmission process for submission of the estate. That's my brief understanding of uh, succession. And here we are talking about interstate, interstate, which have, we have test, tested and interstate. So here we're talking about the one that, uh, the one who died without leaving a will. But now, if we look at the succession process in Kenya in at large, there are some challenges whereby I would like the presenter to, to address. First, I'll find like uh, there is a long process. It takes time and there's huge gap between processes. Like uh, before the confirmation of grant is, is out, you have to wait six months before the grant itself. After gazettement, you have to wait one month. So the process may take, uh, if there is no thorough following, may take one, two years, three years down the line and uh, the, the process is not complete. And the other thing is very technical and, and expensive. A normal, normal person, there must be some, some, some advocate help. And uh, so someone cannot, the, the property cannot be transferred to beneficiary because is somehow if um, um, I don't have the financial capability of being an advocate, it becomes problematic to me. It's like uh, that expensiveness to get the service. And also the other point is uh, tested succession and misuse of human free will. This is my, it may be controversial, it's my understanding that sometimes in the tested succession because of this, like if someone write a will. And uh, to me, it can create some problems because this free will, someone can write anything, like it can, like a house, you can write it like they, they, they want to inherit this house will be my dog or my, this is happening around the world, even though in the Western world, sometimes like a whole property is written under the name of a dog or a never cow this free will sometime if it is not uh, there is no legal provision that maintains it and uh, somehow guide it it may lead to some some implications and uh, I, I don't know if there is such kind of cases in kenya whereby the tested succession and someone write a will that is very problematic and uh, they leave the dependent the family just like that without anything to continue their life and uh, because we just look at the free will of the of the deceased now just returning to the very technical expensive uh, I've, 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 I've seen many problems uh, when talking about the beneficiaries sometimes because they don't have cash to pay for the processes the the estate is being it goes down the generation without being formally transmitted to the to the beneficiaries and when it goes down to the generation there are social implications now the the members become more larger the complication becomes more and misunderstanding uh they, they arise more and uh, we've seen a lot of estate that have reached to the grandchildren and there's no any formalities and now there is chaos in terms of, and maybe all this is also being contributed with the issue of 
being expensive and technical and takes a long time. Uh, that's my input uh, on the topic of today. I would like to hear more from the speaker, Barnis uh, Nganga Muya. It is a wonderful, very wonderful topic. I hope that I'll have interesting questions from me and from others. I welcome you back to the, to Sarah, please. Um, Hello, Sarah. Thank you. Yes, Mohammed. thank you very much uh, for the commentary, uh, reminding us about uh, the UN Peace Day. Uh, that was on Monday, the 23rd day of September. And uh, being able to introduce uh, what uh, uh, Ms. Muya will be able to, to take us through uh, today. Uh, we would like uh, now to be able to invite uh, uh, Ms. Moya uh, to be able to take us through. I know Mohammed has asked a few questions and uh, please feel free uh, to proceed with your presentation, Ms. Moya, and then we will be able to address the questions uh, towards Thank the you. end. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to have this opportunity to present on the topic as to whether succession is a success in Kenya. And therefore, I will just delve into it since the introduction has been done. Let me share my screen so that we can all be able to view as I'm presenting. to get a confirmation, Sarah, are you able to view my screen? Uh, yes, we are able to view your screen. Please proceed. All right. Thank you very much. And so our topic today is family wealth mediation. And we are trying to answer the question, is succession a success in Kenya? First of all, this is the contents of the presentation. We're going to have an introduction. We'll see whether there is necessity for us to plan our estates, what does it entail? We are going to define what succession is and uh, some slight bit of content on estate planning. And then I'm going to deal with some case studies. And I have a slide of two on setting up a mediation practice because uh, let me just give a background that this is a presentation I did once at Wasiliana Hub in March, just before COVID came in and we had this lockdown. So I also had a, a slide on setting up a mediation practice and we are going to conclude. Introduction on me that you already have that I've been an advocate for over 18 years. I'm a, a mediator with MTI for over, from November, 2014. But I would say that in as much as I became a mediator way back in November, 2014, the year 2015, I would say I was just dormant, but in the year 2016, I said this mediation that I got, I need to make use of it. And so there was that long process of getting into FIDA, where those days we would apply to FIDA because we needed to in turn there. I waited for quite a while until June of that year. That is when I was able to get in turn with them. And thereafter, I was now able to apply to the judiciary to be accredited. And I think that happened way back in 2018. So now from 2018, in, I got a case in 2019. But this year, 2020 has been a bit slow. I guess with the uh, setting up, or rather with COVID coming, like I had yesterday, the judiciary was set back because we are used to doing mediation physically. And now with the social distancing, then they had to rethink their strategy. So they've been able to. There are a few mediators who have been doing the process online, and I hope that I will soon be able to continue with the same. Because at FIDA, for FIDA, we have also not been doing much, but now we were trained the other day on the online mediation. So I know that soon we are going to start doing this online mediation. So I've practiced in the corporate world, and I've gone back to practice. So right now I'm running my law firm at Bernice Moya and Associates here in Nairobi. So what are my areas of practice? I'm a mediator, like we have said, and I've said that I'm passionate about alternative dispute resolution. 
And I would say that this interest goes back, way back to when I was in the university many years back, because I did my dissertation on alternative dispute resolution methods. Because many times, or most Kenyans have this idea that when I have a dispute, I need to go to court. And yet we know that the court process, like Mohammed has made his commentary, is very technical, it is expensive, and many times the relationships between the parties are not reserved. So that's why I'm more passionate about mediation and other ADR systems rather than litigation. So in fact, they are among the, two, the areas of law that I have listed. You won't see me listing litigation, though of course that's where I started. And if a matter needs to go to court, I would be able to take it to court. So those are the areas where I specialize mostly commercial and corporate law, labor and employment law. And this is so relevant, like in the days where we are in, uh, this COVID situation has rendered many people jobless and it's not a very pleasant situation. So we know as far as employment law is concerned, there are many disputes that have come up. We also deal with insurance law. Like you've seen, I worked in two insurance companies. I am also a lawyer who registers matters to do with intellectual property trademarks and in Wasiliana Hub there is one of the sessions that we had not even quite a number on trademarks so this is something that has been made uh, the, the members have been made aware of succession and estate planning which is what we are discussing today I also deal with property and real estate law debt collection and uh, I may not need to say that right now with this COVID situation there are very many people who are unable to pay their debts so I believe that cases or matters in this area of debt collection have increased. I'm also a certified public secretary. Nowadays, we are calling ourselves certified secretaries. So I deal with matters to do with companies, registrations, filing annual returns, and all of that. Now coming to the topic, is it necessary for us to discuss succession planning? And I would say this is something that we really need to discuss. Because we work so hard for maybe 10 to 30 or 40 years, depending on how old we started working. Maybe if you started working in your 20s and you retire in your 60s, then you've worked for 40 years. And therefore, the first day we start working draws us closer to that day of retirement or death. It is therefore important that we have to think about succession planning. And succession, how we define it, is that it's an action or process of inheriting a title, an office, or a property. And in the business cycles or circles, they are very good at this because we always know that for a CEO, the succession planning is that there is someone below the CEO who is being groomed to take over when the CEO leaves. If you have a head of department, then below the HOD, the company has already identified someone whom they are grooming to replace the current holder of an office. Because we know that when the leader leaves, either they resign, they retire, or they die, someone else needs to take over that position. But when it comes to our own personal affairs, we are not very good at that. Yet that is the context where we need to, to take more care. Because in our personal affairs, family wealth preservation talks, implies that we need to plan our affairs in preparation for any eventuality because we know we are surely going to retire, we are going to die, or we may be rendered incapable. And the law in Kenya that deals with succession matters is called the Law of Succession Act, which is chapter 160 of the laws of Kenya. And it has been in existence for very, very many years. Like Mohammed has said, there is a bill that came up in 2019, which has not yet come into. It has not yet become law. So we are still dealing with the old law. So when we talk about estate, estate planning and family wealth, we need to ask ourselves, what is an estate? And an estate is all the money and the property that is owned by a particular person, especially at the point of death. Because when one dies, that's when we talk about their estate. So uh, you find that estate planning is often a neglected part of our own financial planning. This is something that we need to take care of, yet we find ourselves not taking care of it until it finds us 
unaware. And I keep saying, well, I'll go into it later on. But why we are saying that succession may not be a success, it's because we have not taken time to plan. So we are saying that individuals will often save, they will have investments, but they are often afraid to encounter that penal time question. You know? What happens to my wealth, my investments, and my loved ones if I die? There is a, this notion in Kenya that if I write a will, it means that I am going to die. And yet, whether we like it or not, death finds us in many different ways. For some people, they become sick, they die, others die because of accidents, and many other ways that people die. So whether we are planning to die or not, it is guaranteed we are going to die. And so it would be better for us to prepare for it. As in, we need to, to do or to face those fears that we have and deal with them. And we'll find that most Kenyans do not have a will. And you will find that even fewer Kenyans have an estate plan that includes trust arrangements. I will talk a bit more about wills and trusts as we move on. And so when we talk about wealth, where does our wealth come from? It comes from land, it comes from pension benefits, from insurance policies, from business proceeds, and many other ways in which we make money. And I decided many of us are Christians, and even those who are not, we may be aware of what the Bible says, and I have quoted the Bible. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. What this clearly means, I'm sure many of us are good. And so this good man or woman, they leave an inheritance, not only for their own children, but they even go back to go, go on to the third generation. They are children's children, that's their grandchildren, and they ensure that they have left something for them. But those others who do not take care of their own things, then they will find out that other people are the ones who are going to benefit from their estates because they failed to make plans. And now, today, where are we discuss, discussing succession? Actually, such a term, Krista, is succession a success? Okay, so what many don't realize is that as soon as one starts working, there is need to prepare for retirement and for succession. Because like we always say, if we do not plan, we are planning to fail. If we leave matters as they are, then for sure, for sure, things are going to happen and they will not find us in a very good situation. So you can make a will, and what a will basically is, is that it's a document that is written. And in this document, you clearly stipulate how you want your wealth to be distributed when you are not around. Though there are also wills that take place even when one is still alive. And another alternative is you can set up a trust. And this is a better step in wealth preservation. Because what happens is that when you set up a will, a will uh, shows how your wealth is going to be distributed. So of course, when it's distributed, whoever gets it, let's say you have four children and you've divided your estate among the four. So each one of them has a free will on S2, how they choose to use that wealth. Some of course may misuse it. And so at the end of the day, the wealth is depleted. But when you set up a trust, then the whole of your estate is included in that trust. And so you are able to preserve it that wealth based on the way you have set up the trust and how your trustees are going to affect the will that you had. And uh, what we know is that we have very many stories in the media of people who failed to plan and their families have had to endure many court battles. And these court battles last for very, very many years. Maybe I would like to mention at this point, there is one case which we are going to discuss more, one of Peter Mbiu Kwenange. He died way back in 1981. His case has lasted in court for like 39 years. And 39 years, I'm sure many of those beneficiaries have died. Many things have changed. And I'm sure that if you woke up today, you would actually be shocked to know what has happened to his estate. And I'm sure that is not what he would have intended. But because he failed to write a will, then he had no control. Because you see, that's what happens. I think it's important for us to, uh, to consider this. When we are alive, we have a say over our matters. But the moment we breathe our last, 
that is the last time we ever make any decision. So whatever happens thereafter, we have no say over the same. So we can see that this is winter. In winter, we are skating, we are having fun. We are saying summer will be coming. That will be the time to do some estate planning. But who knows whether you're going to be around in summer. As long as it is day, even when it's winter, we should do. It's better for us to have a plan and to have none at all. So what is estate planning? An estate encompasses the interests, the rights, and the entitlements that one has, either the real or personal. And in financial terms, we say this is your net worth because we have all your assets minus your liabilities and we get your net worth. So why do we need to plan? We need to plan so that we have an assured future for our beneficiaries. And these beneficiaries are one spouse, one's issues, and issues are children, that's how the law defines them, especially minors, because minors do not have a say and they are not recognized as to, they are not able to make decisions on their own. So we have to really take care of our children so that they are not left destitute after us having worked so hard for so many years. And we also need to take care of our relatives because in Africa, we care about our relatives. And another advantage or another reason why we need to plan is so that we can get a bit of a control of the destiny. Like I said, the moment we breathe our last, we are no longer in control. But if we have put our affairs in order while we are still alive, then we have a bit of control over our destinies. And it's also important for us to plan so that we get some tax benefits, especially some exemptions from paying tax. CGT is capital gains tax. It's usually paid when you, like, you sell a property. So the income that one gets, that is supposed to be, you pay the tax on that. And it's also paid when you sell shares and we also have stamp duty. So uh, those are the benefits that we get, tax benefits, so it's important for us to provide for them. Moving on. Something has happened, let me see. Okay. Are the essentials of estate planning and how does estate planning work? I talked about trusts and wills which come into play. What is a trust? A trust, now this is a document that you put in your will in need or rather how you'd let things to go. It is the right which is enforceable solely in equity to the beneficial enjoyment of property belonging to another person who holds their legal title. And this other person is you, you, when you have this, it could be for your children or for other people whom you want to provide for. And a trust may be set up. When we are talking about this prospective settler, this is a person setting up a trust. He enters into an agreement and this agreement is called a settlement or trust deed, which is then registered. Once it's registered, it comes into force. And this settler appoints trustees who will manage his or her estate. How about a will? Because we've talked about trusts and wills. There are different types of wills. We have oral wills. These are wills that one says, this is how I would like my estate to be administered when I'm gone. But there is a condition that a, an oral will can only be valid for three months. It has to be made in the presence of two witnesses. When we say three months for it to be valid, it means that if one was to make a will in September and they die in December, that will is still valid. But if somebody dies in January, then that will is not valid. It's only alive for three months. There are also conditional wills that come into force when a certain condition is fulfilled. We have privileged wills and they are made by those in the army and they can be oral. So maybe before one goes into war, because they are not sure what will happen, they can make a, such a privileged will and it will be taken to be enforced. There are also living wills which deal with how one is to be treated in case of incapacity. So when one is still alive, they write a will and say, if, I am, if maybe I become, I have dementia or I become mentally incapable, this is how I want to be treated. 
and we have written wills, which is what is most effective, or what we know uh, the wills to be mostly. And the written wills are the wills that someone goes and writes before a lawyer, and it's required to be witnessed by two people. And of course, the person making who is called the testator, he needs to sign it, and then it becomes effective. And usually we say, we call it a last will and testament. The person making it is called a testator. They appoint an executor. It can be one or two people who are going to execute the estate. And they also describe how they want their estate to be treated. So when we now come to the estate planning process, what do we need to do? We need to create, uh, what we find is that uh, for many of us who have been working for quite a number of years, you may have got one plot here, another plot there, you have a house, you have a car, you have many assets here and there. You even have, uh, let's say, what insurance policies. So for the first step is to create an inventory of what you own and what you owe. Because we say that is what gives you your net worth. Then you need to develop a contingency plan. You need to provide for your children and for your dependents. And why you are doing this is so that you can protect your assets and you also document your wishes. You also appoint fiduciaries. When we say fiduciaries, we mean trustees or people whom you want to execute this plan. Then when we move on to this matter of succession, and whether it's a success in Kenya, we need to ask ourselves how accessible is justice in Kenya. Uh, the constitution in Article 48 provides access to justice as a constitutional requirement. And it says that the state has a responsibility of ensuring that this takes place. I would like to read the article. Uh, it says that the state shall ensure access to justice for all persons and if any fee is required, it shall be reasonable and shall not impede access to justice. So the responsibility to ensure that there is access to justice is upon the state and it is supposed to be for all persons. But can we say that we all have access to justice? I'm sure there are many, many people who say they do not have access to justice. And it doesn't matter that they could have gone to court. Because going to court is one thing, feeling that you got, you got what you really wanted is something else. First of all, the commentator talked about the expensive process. Here, the article in the constitution says that if any fee is required, it should be reasonable and should not impede access to justice. But well, of course, if you need to go to court, you have to pay some money for filing fees. And if you have decided to use a lawyer, you need to pay your lawyer fees. <clears throat> so that fact alone is an impediment to access to justice. We are finding that access to justice is more than improving an individual's access to court or guaranteeing legal representation. When we delve further into that, it means that it is the ability of people to seek and obtain a remedy, and this remedy should be through formal and informal institutions of justice. And this has to be in compliance with human rights standards. Equal, equal access to justice should involve extending the reach of, form, of the formal rule of law institutions to the population. And they need to do this by removing barriers to their use. This is what the, the judiciary itself has defined it in their status report on sustaining judiciary transformation. And this report was released on 4th of March, 2020. And we can see that the judiciary has tried to bring this access to justice to the population. Recently, I think it was in the month of, of uh, August, when the Chief Justice launched, launched this alternative justice systems, whereby these are in, at these informal institutions where people can go to access justice. And we find mediation as one of these, because we know that mediation is much more accessible. It can be accessible to more people if they know. It is much cheaper. And we are also aware that uh, mediation gives people the sort of settlement that they can live with. Because like what I said is you can go to court, 
the court process the way it is, it is adversarial. When we say adversarial means you have an adversary. It's either me, I get justice and you don't. It is not a win-win situation. If one party wins, the other one loses. But with mediation, we can have a win-win situation where each party, because we say in mediation, the mediator just helps the parties to come to a settlement. It is what each party can live with. And we find that in court, uh, the court process does not care about emotions, but uh, the mediation process takes care of emotions. Because for many people, why they even decide to go to, go to court, some of them want to teach the other person a lesson, which really is not a way to access justice. So now coming to the real matter of our discussion today, this question that we are seeking to answer, is succession a success in Kenya? And my answer is that it is not. It is not a success because we have too many succession cases in court. In the area, we have cases of prominent families. And this, this, their disputes have been in court for very long. I just mentioned Peter Mbiu Koinange. In one of the slides, I'm going to tell you exactly how long. I already said uh, 39 years, how long his case has been in court. We also have the, now we are just talking about the prominent cases. We have the case of Njenga Karume estate. He died on 12th of February, 2012. And in as much as he had set up a trust, there were issues with the execution of that trust. And the actual situation is that his assets have shrunk from about 20 billion. I don't know how much less it is right now, but we know for sure that it has shrunk. We know that his children and grandchildren are destitute. When we come to the slide on his estate, we'll say more about it. And we are also aware it's in public domain that his hotel, the Jacaranda Hotel has been up for auction. And there is a report that I had reviewed on the court annexed mediation. This report provides that there were 1542 matters, family matters that had been referred to mediation. Out of those, at that point, which was, I think, last year in October, 1036, that's 1,036, had been concluded. 497 of them had settlement agreements, meaning that those ones had succeeded. Mediation had succeeded. Yesterday, I was in a meeting organized by the Nairobi Center on International Arbitration, and one of the uh, facilitators or the panelists was Justice Ocheng. Is a judge in Kisumu, in the courts in Kisumu, and he presented that he estimates that mediation in Kenya has had 50% success. When we were registering for this uh, webinar today, one of the questions that we were being asked is whether we think, uh, as in how would we make uh, mediation more of a success in succession matters? And how I answered it is I said that we need to publicize mediation more so that we can have more of these cases instead of them being filed in court coming to mediation. Uh, there's one slide where I've said the next one, yes. Why do I think that the succession has not been a success in Kenya? One of the reasons I gave is that there is a failure by the persons, the individuals to write wills or set up trusts. Because you will find many of the cases go to court because many of those people who die, die intestate. When we say intestate, means they do not write a will. And like I said, when I started my presentation, the moment we breathe our last, we are no longer able to say how we want our estates to be distributed. But when we still have the breath of life, that's the opportunity for us to set up our wills, to write our wills or to set up trust. The second reason, I would say it's the law itself, the Law of Succession Act. This act, like I said, has been there for very many years. It's an old act. And in the last meeting that I was referring to that we had at Wasiliana Hub, we even had one of the young mediators like do an exposition of the act itself. And in one way, we find the act favors men because it only provides that if a wife remarries, then she loses whatever she had inherited from her husband. But there is no equal provision on the same if a man remarries. And when this law, the, the law itself, 
its provision on dependence. It provides for too many people who can make a claim to one's estate. One may even have written a will and provided, this is how I want my estate to be distributed. But still, there are very many people who can challenge that will in court, and the process can end up taking so long. At the end of the day, that's why we have too many cases in court. And the third reason I've given is the court process itself. It is technical. It is rare that you will find a layman finding a succession suit in, in court. Eh? We call them succession causes. Because first of all, like uh, our commentator said, uh, we have to have beneficiaries. We need to sit and agree. And even when they agree, there are many documents that are required. They need to go to the chief. The chief has to write a letter. And nowadays, when I file a succession matter in court, they even want the original death certificate. And even where to file a matter, there could, someone could have died in Nairobi, but because their land is located, let's say, in Moranga, the matter has to be filed in Moranga. You know, it's too technical. And so not many people are able to file these cases. And we also talked about, he talked about expense. If you're not able to afford that, the money to file that, it may not be too expensive, but it also depends on where one is coming from. There are some parties who are not able to afford that. And because it looks, well, it's not that it looks like. For you to get that grant, it has to be granted by the court. So it means that every person who dies then, and they want to deal with their estate, they have to go to court. Because even the person who has a will, that will also has to go to court. That those are the matters we call probate and administration. The will still has to go to court. So all that process, makes it makes it too long. So we find there are too many cases, so there are backlogs. The lawyers, uh, like you will see, the lawyers themselves can make the process take too long than the time it's required to take. Where the parties themselves are disputing, some of them because of corruption can bribe court officials such that a file disappears. So there are very many things that cause this, but we should look for a way on how to deal with them. I've looked at uh, some few perspectives. On the family disputes perspective, there is failure to agree or to compromise because like we said, when one dies, then the beneficiaries need to agree. So that once they file the matter in court, then it does not end up taking forever. It just goes ahead. If the, it is not disputed, it's usually a simple process where the court then issues letters of administration. They add the limited grant, and then after six months, it's confirmed. One of those cases, this case you have quoted of Albert Karume and two others, Vazas Kongogatabaki and another. And then it was a civil case, number 125 or 2015, deals with the Njenga Karume estate. And you will find that Albert Karume is one of the children, the sons to Njenga Karume, while Kungo Gatabaki and the other person, these were the trustees to the estate. So the main dispute as far as Njenga Karume's estate was concerned is a failure to agree between the children and the trustees whom he had appointed. Then secondly, the family dispute can come up family members keep a dispute in court preventing the rightful beneficiaries from being paid. This is the Kirema case. Margaret Kirema and four others versus Catherine Jerry Masharia and another in this case was filed in 2014. This is a case uh, whose details I'm well aware of because the last law firm I worked for before I came to set up my own we were representing some of the parties here and what I found is that every year regardless of how much work had been done, the lawyers had to be paid a certain amount of money. So if the longer a case stays in court, the worse it is for the beneficiaries and the more someone's estate gets depleted. We also have the Mbio Penanga estate. So now if I go to each of these I had mentioned, or before I go to that, I wanted to, <clears throat> to just explain further on the Law of Succession Act. And one of these, which I think is the biggest cause of the failure of the law, is how far or how wide it provides for dependence. So this section 29 uh, defines who a dependent is. At A, it says the wife or wives 
and many of the cases which I have come across are usually polygamous cases, many more rather than where one had one wife. It even provides for a former wife or former wives and the children of the deceased, whether or not they were being maintained by the deceased immediately prior to his death, meaning that children who are married, children who are grown up, still have a right to claim to somebody's estate. And then we have such of the deceased parents, even step parents, grandparents, grandchildren, stepchildren, children whom the deceased had taken into his family as his own. They may not have been his biological children, brothers and sisters and half brothers and half sisters as were being maintained by the deceased immediately prior to his death. And where the deceased was a woman, her husband, if he was being maintained by her immediately prior to the date of her death. This last bit, the section C, is one of those I was referring to, where it says that even a dependent can be someone's as, as in husband, yes, if he was being maintained by her immediately prior to the date of, of her death. So can you see how wide this interpretation of the law is? I believe that this is one of those. And also, even where I read in the act itself, where even where one has a will, if someone feels that what has been left to them is not what they would have wanted, they have a right to challenge that. Yet I, when I write a will, it is what I have worked for. So I am the one who should determine how much somebody else gets. As long as I am not leaving out to my dependent, then the, the ones whom I leave the property to should not have a right to challenge what I have willed. That is what I feel. I don't know whether at the end you will have the same view as I have, but we will have such a session. I had talked about this case study of Peter Mbiu Koinange. Excuse me. His succession cause number 527 of 1981. And of course, it deals with the estate of Mbiu Koinange. He died, he was a minister in Jomo Kenyatta's government. I also saw that he was a minister in Moi's government. And he left an estate which was worth over 30 billion Kenya shillings. That's quite a huge estate. He died in Tested on 3rd September 1981. So he had not written a will. And he had four wives. He was polygamous. And out of all these four wives, the first two wives had children. The wife number three and wife number four did not have children. And his case had been in court since 1981. It was finally dealt with in May of this year. And why the dispute? Uh, you will find that the Law of Succession Act provides that anyone who dies after the law had been uh, had come into force, then their matter has to be dealt with under that Law of Succession Act. But these two last wives who did not have children were trying to argue that Mbiu um, Koinange's estate should be dealt with under Kikuyu customary law. So that just, I don't see how that would have the light of day. And so this estate has been in court for very many years. But also why, you see, like we are talking that the estate was worth 30 billion shillings, one of the biggest estate or other properties that they were disputing about is called close barn estate. Close barn estate is on Limuru Road and has been sold to several parties. I saw first of all, uh, but that the court had to give, to give uh, authority for the estate because the person is already dead and then the matter is in court. The Aga Khan Foundation uh, was sold to part of the estate center. That is where Two Rivers is built. So if you know where Two Rivers is, that was part of Bill Koenange's estate. And there is also this Karura Community Chapel, which is a church near, near, uh, near Two Rivers. So that estate has been one, or rather, yes, that uh, property has been one of the main causes of the dispute for this estate. But at least finally, we thank God, uh, the, the, the court gave its ruling and the court ruled that the estate has to be divided equally among the 12 beneficiaries. So that brought the dispute to an end, but you can imagine 39 years, how much money the lawyers have made. And there was a complaint by one of the dependents that uh, there are many other people, the administrators who have benefited while other persons have not benefited equally. So that is what 
when we say succession has not been a success, this is what we see. James Kanyotu, he was a second spy chief after Bernard Hinger. He retired in 1991 after serving Kenya for 27 years. So he, we talked about how many years you're going to work before you retire. For him, he served Kenya for 27 years. He retired and then he died in the year 2008 and was worth Kenya shillings, 20 billion. This case has been pending in court for over 11 years. He left behind four widows and children. I think I hope you are seeing the common denominator in these matters that many of these cases are where the man was polygamous. So there are four houses. He had nine recognized children. Then there was one more who is claiming to be a son. I'm sure that has to do with the, some of the disputes in court because this other son has to prove that he's also a beneficiary. And some of his estates have been taken over by the unclaimed financial assets authority. I think uh, it was being said that he had so much wealth and had not even disclosed all of it to his dependents, so some of it then had to be taken over by this authority. And we know that his estate has been wasted in court disputes. So out of this 20 billion estate, I am not sure how much of which is going to go to his beneficiaries when the matter is finally decided. We have the case of Njenga Karume. He died on 12th of February, 2012. He had done a good job. We know his story. He worked so hard from being a charcoal burner. Yeah, and he left an estate which, is, which was worth over 50 billion. But, and he even tried, I said there are very few Kenyans who set up trust but he was one of those. He set up a trust, but the issue was the dispute between his trustees and his children. And so his estate has shrunk so much. We know that his children and grandchildren are destitute. So these trustees and the family have been fighting over control over the vast estate since 2015. And the children and grandchildren have suffered. There is a daughter who died and also a granddaughter who died due to lack of money for treatment. And there have been claims that the estates, the trustees are mismanaging the estate, when the trustees claim that the children want to take control of the estate against their father's will. You know that Jacaranda Hotel has been up for auction. I think one of the developments in this matter is that finally the court decided that these trustees need to be replaced. So that process I think is the one ongoing where his trustees are being replaced and one of the lessons from him, I think one of them could have been a close relative who was a trustee. So that needs to be avoided. I also looked at another case which deals with the revocation of grant. We said that once you go to court, you get limited letters of administration. Then after six months, if there are no disputes, you will get your grant confirmed by the court. So once the grant is confirmed, then now you're free to distribute to the estate of the deceased person. So in this case, which is succession cause of number eight of 2018 in the Homa Bay High Court, dealing with the estate of Omolo Onyango. And this case now was filed by uh, an objector because this person objected to the grant that had been granted. And the objector is called Alphonse Atieno Omolo, which, who is a son of the deceased. And he went to court applying for revocation. To revoke, of course, is to, to say that he wanted the grant set aside. And this grant had been granted to his stepbrother, Peter Obonya Omolo, way back on 15th of December 2005. I'd like to make a comment there and say that this Peter Obonyo, who is one of the sons of the deceased, went to court on and had a grant on 15th of December 2005. Yet, like uh, 13 years later, this other son went to court to have this grant set aside. And this grant had been confirmed on 9th of September 2009. So why we may even have all these matters and why we are saying succession is not a success is that even when you go to court and you have the court grant, you give, give you a grant and the grant confirmed, someone still has an opportunity to go to court and have that grant revoked and you go back to the whole process of letters of administration. The issue here was that this objector went to court and said that the other son had obtained the grant fraudulently 
since he had failed to disclose all the beneficiaries of the estate of, dece of the deceased, and the, the deceased in this case had married five wives. And of course, the matter went on, the evidence was given by affidavits, and the court held that since the petitioner, that is the son, Peter Obonyo, had failed to include all the beneficiaries of the deceased, and he had also concealed material facts, the grant had to be revoked. When we are talking about these material facts, some of the facts were that the deceased person had two properties, but when the petitioner went to court, he only disclosed one property, and when the grant was confirmed, he himself asked the court to grant him that property, and he didn't care about the other, the other children who are there. There were other sons and there were other daughters, but he only wanted himself to be provided for. And the court, the court gave very good, uh, uh, he, the court talked quite a bit on the law, and the court held that this act, that is the Law of Succession Act, it seeks to ensure that the right persons inherit the property of the deceased and the right procedure for doing so. And the court even said that if the deceased person had written a will, then there would not have been any need for the parties to go to court. It goes to emphasize the point I had said earlier, that where one has a will, you avoid some of these disputes. So what are the lessons that we can learn on family wealth creation? In the media, there are estimates that there are suits worth 500 billion. I hope you can see that figure, 500 billion relating to inheritance disputes, which are pending in court from departed billionaire. 500 billion is quite a figure. If some of these cases were brought to mediation, I am sure that they would be uh, dealt with in a much faster time and there would be better relations between the beneficiaries to one's disease, one's estate. And all these cases are pending in court. And you will see my second point there is that the court system appears to only benefit estate administrators and the lawyers on both sides. I think I already alluded to that. And we find that family relations get strained and the children suffer. Like we have seen the estate of Jenga Karume, the children have suffered. I'm sure even in all these other estates, the children end up suffering. Yet in the first place, when we are talking about family wealth creation, you want to pass on your wealth to your children, even to your grandchildren. And so what that means is that they need to make plans in advance so as to preserve your wealth and this is also something that you can pass on to the persons who come to you for mediation. So what we need to ensure is that as a starting point, we all write wills or set up trusts. Like I said in the first step in nested planning, you need to be clear while alive how your wealth will be shared. Because the moment you're not here, then you're not the one making the decision as to how your wealth will be shared. And I'm saying that our farm will be available to assist you in preparation of a will or a trust. And you also, for those who are in family business, there is need to nurture enough passion for the business in your dependents. I would like to say that we Africans are very different from the Asians. What the Asians do is that they involve their children in their businesses. And so it becomes much easier to pass on the business to the children and they are able to train them early some of them, even when they retire, the children are able to take the business to the next level. I think I'd like to give an example of the Chandaria family. Yeah, we know that Manu Chandaria is old, but I think he has passed on the business to Dashan Chandaria, who is now the CEO. And there are more lessons. We need to ensure that business dealings or operations are well known to close family members so that when one moves on or when they pass away then, the children don't get shocked to find out what really this person was all about. And the challenges of family business are governance, leadership transitions, and survival after the founder's exit. This is very, very true. These are things we see on a daily basis. If you carefully look at the businesses that we have, which are family owned, so then there is need to take care of this so as to ensure that there is smooth transition. There is also another lesson that we need to keep open lines of communication with our family members. 
so that we know their strengths, their weaknesses, and their interests. One suggestion which I found to be quite important and needs to be made practical is to have family meetings. And in those family meetings, give your children, you know, uh, I am in a women's uh, organization where one of the leaders says that how they grew up is that their family was like a board. The father and the mother are the ones who are, let's say the father is a chairman, maybe the mother is a vice chair, and the children are the other director. So they were given an opportunity to present their issues. And she says that she herself used to be appointed as a secretary. And so that is how she grew up and end up, ended up becoming a company secretary. So if we would run our families that way, as in give our children a say in the matter. So let them know they have a say, have family meetings. By the way, we would be surprised by the sort of ideas we can get from our children. Let's not treat them as just children, but let's treat them as people who have ideas that we can bring in and which can benefit all of us. And most of these lessons, I got them from the Standard Online. Now, what are some practical steps that we can take so as to ensure that we don't have the issues, the succession issues that I have talked about? When it comes to buying land or a house, you can either have the same registered jointly with your spouse so that in case either of you passes away, then the property passes on to the other person. Alternatively, if you're afraid that your spouse may not take care of your children's interests when you're not around, then you can register it as ownership in common. So those are two. You can either have it as joint. When it is joint, if someone passes away, it, get, it moves on to the other person. But when you have ownership in common, it means you have certain shares that are yours. And then if you pass on that property the way you have intended for it to pass on, that is how it will. It does not automatically pass to the other person. Then you can also register a company or rather register the property in a company name such that your children can be shareholders in the company. You also need to ensure that you're very clear about your pension dues or insurance policies and how you want them distributed since this does not form part of the estate in a will. So in those for those who are employed or if you have also bought insurance policies, is that form where you nominate beneficiaries, make sure that you are provided for all your beneficiaries, because what happens is that you may have taken, let's say, an taken out an education policy. Maybe you had two children, now you have three, and you've not included the third one. So in case of anything, the third one will not be provided for. Or how if you change your mind on how you want your pension dues to be distributed, then you need to communicate to the relevant person's insurance company so that they update the, uh, the beneficiaries form. And for those who are married, and maybe they were not married, they don't have a marriage certificate, you need to have at least an affidavit so that they are recognized as, the couple, as a couple. And it, has, it is now a requirement of the law. I think from the year 2014 or 2017, the New Marriage Act came into force in the year 2014. I think the requirement to have marriage is registered came a bit later in 2017. So even the customary marriages need to be registered with the Attorney General. in summary, this may not be very clear from here, but I can read it for you, that there are nine steps to succession planning. There is a family bit and then there is a business transition planning. So for the family, there is need to plan and to communicate, like we said earlier. Then there is ownership planning and alignment so that your children own your vision and they are able to be a, a, a part and parcel of the business. You have to plan for retirement. And when you're planning for retirement, also plan for your estate, the estate planning that we've talked about today. And like we said, the biggest challenge, challenge for family-owned businesses is governance. So there is need to provide for this. Because a family-owned business does not necessarily mean that the board has to be the family members. You can also incorporate independent directors so that they are able to bring in their expertise into the family business. As far as now the business is concerned, there's need for strategic planning, there's need for risk assessment and contingency planning. As far as the management is concerned, there's need to organize the same and 
uh, for family leadership development so that there are people to take over the business. And once they take over, then because the business also exists in a community, there is need for stakeholder communication and planning in advance so that at the right time then the communication goes out. And now, now this is the other slide or the last two slides that I talked about in as far as setting up your own mediation practice is concerned. So there are seven critical success factors for you to succeed as a mediator. Let's even call it a family mediator. Uh, the person, who are you? You have to start with yourself, eh? a bit of introspection. Who are you? Are you self-aware? Do you know your strengths and your weaknesses? I'll delve a bit more on that. And then the process. Are you conversant with mediation in succession planning? That you need to gain the knowledge. And in as much as you may not be a lawyer, there is no harm in you getting to know a bit more of what does the law provide and as far as succession is concerned and which part can I, or which role can I play in this process. And like we said from the time of the COVID, it need for mediators to also know how to conduct mediation online. So that's also another skill that is required of the mediator. Then market outreach, like I said, we have to create the awareness. People out there need to know that we are mediators, that we have the skills, we have the knowledge, and we even have the experience to be able to handle these disputes. We also need to have networks and collaborations. We usually say that your network is your net worth, and Wasiliana Hub is doing a good job in bringing together mediators for such a purpose. Now, when it comes to practice setup, we need to have a professional practice like lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, every professional has a practice that they have set up. It's the same way we need to take mediation, take it like it's there, that professional practice that we need to set up, therefore ensure that we have a business plan and, and, and take care of it just like you would set up any other business. Of course, when you are setting up your mediation practice, you need to be paid for your services. So you have to consider your fees, how much will you charge, and uh, are the fees going to be reasonable? How will the fees be paid? Many times in mediation, we say that the parties should share the fees equally. So of course, when you are conducting the mediation, then you need to make the parties aware and they need to agree to the same. Learning and growth is that we need to ensure that we are continuously growing through CPD, through gaining these new skills that I have said, and as far as doing mediation online is concerned. Now, when we are talking about further setting up your practice and the person, so what is your vision? What is your drive? Why did you become a mediator? I've talked about self-awareness so that you know your strengths and your weaknesses. And one of the ways in which you can get to this is to write an essay to yourself. Why should anyone employ you as a mediator? What are your skills? What is your experience? As in, why should people come to you and employ you as their mediator? Then you need to write a short mediator bio. What is your training? What is your experience? You need to have subject matter expertise and solid mediation training. And here we are saying that your own personal rep reputation is key because people come to you. Like one of the speakers was saying yesterday, what has been found to work is that, for example, for pastors, people already uh, feel that pastors are there are many of them, it may not be all of them, but many of them are already persons of integrity. They have been dealing with the congregation. They have a track record. So people come to them even when they have their own counseling matters. And so when it comes to mediation, then they are more likely to go to them. And there are some who have really made out a niche for themselves as mediators. Maybe there is one I can mention here. We know Reverend Jenga, for some of us who are mediators know him. It's had a track record for that. And we need continuous training so that we continue honing our skills. So one other thing that you can do is start reading the mediation books. We have one called Getting to Yes, Getting Past No. And there are many videos on YouTube on mediation. And we also need to get connected, be a member of an association like this one, a Siliana Hub, get a mentor or a coach because we get mentors for many other things, but also professionally, it's important for us to get mentors and to get coaches. And uh, another way for us to 
to continue gaining more experience is to volunteer to mediate. Like I had mentioned, I mediate in FIDA. You can also do that in churches, in mosques. And we are saying that this is the fastest way to have mediation experience. Because here you're not telling people you have to pay me, but where people you volunteer and then they see what you can do, they will have more confidence now to either refer you or when they themselves get another dispute, they can come to you. And of course, we have the court connected mediation programs and you need to practice. Practice in your own backyard, set up an ADR practice group, that is something you can think about. Then look for educational and speaking opportunities and also write something. Write articles on topics that are important to you and you will be able to find a receptive audience. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Ara. Sarah, Angari, will to take over. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bernice, for being able to take us through uh, the presentation, helping us to understand uh, what exactly uh, succession involves and giving us some very good examples uh, from our own Kenyan courts. And then finally, uh, leaving us uh, mediators with some questions uh, to think about. We'll go into a, a question and answer uh, session. Uh, I will just begin by reading a comment uh, from Edwin Apacha. And uh, Edwin says that sometimes us men are the ones who lay fertile grounds for disputes when we pass Uh, sorry about that. As uh, we go into question and answer, we do have uh, Mohamed Said. Uh, Mohamed Said is a, a young mediator and he was able to give us a commentary at the beginning of this uh, afternoon's uh, session where he touched on the UN uh, Peace Day and was able to introduce uh, the topic uh, for today. Uh, Mohamed, uh, please. Uh, Field your questions to Ms. Muya kindly. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for uh, for the for the wonderful presentation, Ms. Muya. We have uh, benefited a lot. I personally have benefited, uh, have benefited a lot in terms of uh, estate planning, inheritance, successions, and what to be done about it. My questions comes in when you talk about succession. Now, if these uh, beneficiaries, they can't agree on administrator, who to administer their estate. And uh, the law requires that they must agree among themselves on an administrator. So now they cannot agree. So the, the process of succession cannot uh, kick off. Is there any alternative options? Oh, mediation can come in or the law provide any alternative options in terms of this scenario. Thanks a lot. Do I answer that? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the questions. I saw the commentary from Edwin and it's actually true. It's good that he admits yes. Like you found many of the issues are brought about by the men who don't, uh, they are all their beneficiaries are, and we have seen it as a practice in many, many, let's say many prominent uh, people when they pass on like politicians, that's when other wives come up, other children come up, yet if they had provided for all of them, because like we saw the Law of Succession Act is very wide, provides for all those people, then the cases would be fewer. The question by Mohammed on administrators, 
Uh, first of all, maybe I needed to clarify that the way the Law of Succession Act is, is that it must not always be that you must have one administrator. What there is, is that, for example, where they are, uh, they are minors, they are children who are below 18 years, then you need to have two administrators, not one, so two administrators. For example, they are not able to agree on one administrator, they can appoint two administrators. And if it comes out of, let's say, because there are many of the issues are with the polygamous families, if like the ones we have seen, there were four, four, four wives, they can agree that two of them would be the joint administrators. But if at all they are not able to agree completely, then like we are always saying, yeah, the suggestion you've given that the, the mediation comes into place so that they are able then to, to have an admin, a mediator help them agree even on a, an administrator. Um, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Muya. Uh, Mohammed, uh, you can ask another set of questions um, and then we will proceed. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, it was a wonderful reply, I've understood. Now, my, my second question is, uh, uh, we, you have seen that uh, in accordance to the main examples you have given, the, there is a conflict between uh, the trustees and the beneficiary. And uh, one of the recommendations that you have given that it's better for someone to plan, to plan his estate before his death by writing a will, and by writing a will which involves trustees. And now, even by doing that, you cannot avoid the conflict that you're seeing between the trustees and, uh, and the beneficiary. So there's a need of a good will of those and uh, the trustees are the trustee themselves because sometimes it creates problem for the beneficiaries. Now, how can uh, mediation comes in? Is there a scenario, a case that you have dealt with that uh, you have mediated between trustees and beneficiaries, and why why this conflict between the two? Uh, is there maybe can get uh, a segregation of how to solve this? Because we expect to recur again and again. Okay, uh, first of all, I think I need to clarify that there are two, where we are talking about the will, for the will, then you have the executors, then for the trust, that is where we have the trustees. So first of all, the, in, in the legal terms, those are two things, eh? they are two different things. So you may have written a good will and uh, executors are the people who will have to implement your wishes. So you need to then to be clear that the people whom you have appointed are people who will be able to, uh, to administer your estate the way you would like it to be administered. So if they fail to do that, then disputes will come up. And it is the same with a trust. Eh? But once you set up your trust and there are disputes between the trustees and the beneficiaries, I think that's an issue of who are these trustees that you appointed? Do they understand the mandate that you gave them? And how willing are they to, uh, to ensure that your, your, your trust is administered in as far as the trust is the document that you set up? There are things that you're not able to control. You only hope that once it is in place that it will be implemented as you would like. And mediation comes in. I think I'm aware that in some of these big disputes, the court has referred them to mediation. But like we know, mediation, the parties have to be willing. They have to agree because the court, the mediator cannot force a decision on them. So also the skills of the mediator come into place on how far they are able to help the parties come to an agreement. So as far as I myself am concerned, I haven't dealt with a succession dispute have mostly dealt with family disputes, like matters to do with divorce and custody, but succession, I haven't dealt with one. But I feel that the experience of the mediator and how well they are able to bring the parties together, that is a key skill that determines 
whether this succession matter will be settled at mediation and doesn't have to go back to court. Um, uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Moya. Uh, a few more questions here. Um, what is the best time to prepare for succession? What is the best time to prepare for succession? And then how long does it take to be able to make the succession plan? How long does it take to be able to make the succession plan? And uh, together with that, uh, who, does, uh, the, the, who does the family work with in planning for succession? So who exactly is involved in this succession planning business? And what exactly is the role of those who are involved? Uh, you could take those uh, three to four questions together, and then we will give you another set. Okay. So the first question deals with the best time to plan for succession. And I think at the beginning of my presentation, I said, as soon as you start working, you see you already have some income. That is a good time for you to start planning about your, the succession that is estate planning, because that's the time you start thinking of what will I invest in? How do I want my life to be? So as you're thinking about what to invest in, as you are buying property, it's good to start at that point. But also, for example, once one gets married and you have children, if you are already at that point and you haven't made a plan, then you are late. It means that you need to do that as a matter of urgency. So the best time to start is as soon as you start working, but also by the time you're getting married and having children, then it means that you must have your succession plan in place. As to how long a succession plan takes, I wouldn't say it takes long, because for example, if, it, if you have decided that it's a will that you want to prepare, you just go to a lawyer once you have your inventory. So what may take time is for you to get your inventory. And the inventory means that you're getting all your assets, all your liabilities, and if there are properties, the titles, are the titles in your names, uh, if maybe they need to be transferred and things like those, that is what may take time. But if the plan itself, like for a will, think one session, once you sit with a lawyer, one session you can start, but I feel that within a month or so, you should have already finished with your will, if it's a will. The trust may take longer because there's a process of preparing the trusted, having it registered at the land's office and all those places. And if especially you want to incorporate it as a different, call it like a matter. So for a trust, some of them end up taking like close to two years, at least 18 months. Eh? So for a trust, it may take much longer. But for a will, you can do it within a very short time because it does not even need to be registered. Once you have signed it and you've executed it and you have kept it, well, I didn't talk about where to keep it. You could either keep it in your home, you could keep it with your lawyer, but there's also a bit of the probate with the courts. But yeah, once it's already executed, it's good to go. And then for the succession plan, for a business, I, I, I was not too clear on whether this third question, the succession plan, is it for a business? Because if it's for your own person, let me talk about if it's your own succession plan, you don't need to involve many people, but what you need to do is, you've already decided, I'm going to write a will, for example. I will write a will. You don't have to involve your children. It is you or your spouse. It is you deciding, this is how I want my estate to be divided. So that one, you don't need to involve any other person except for, you need these two witnesses. And for the people that you have decided are going to be your executors, you also need to involve them. If you decide that you're going to set up a trust, then it means that you also need to have, of course, the lawyer, but you also need to have your trustees. And I think that's as far as it goes. So if it's your own, you as individually, that's okay. If it is succession planning for your business, then that's where now you need to 
involve more people. And that's why I was saying that for the business, you need to involve your family. So that first of all, even before you, work, of course you have a plan in future, how I want it to move on the business for me to my children. So you need to involve them in the family business as you are doing the business. And as they are there, then you have time to assess their strengths, their weaknesses, their interests, so that then you can decide so and so is the one who will succeed me. And also your wife, if it's a whole family business, so that the whole of your family is involved in that. I hope that then I have answered that question and it is much clear to the person who has asked it. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'll just give you another set of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so Ruth Mwangi asks, Sir, are there clear signs that mediation will or may not work for a particular case? Are there clear signs that mediation will or may not work for a particular case? What then uh, should the mediator look out for? Uh, you can take that uh, together with this one. Uh, which skills are important for professional mediators handling families and family well mediation? Which skills are important for professional mediators handling families and family well mediation? Uh, you could take those, please. Okay. Let me answer. Start with Ruth's question as to where there are clear signs that mediation will or may not work for a particular case. Uh, I don't, I think, for example, well, I think mediation works for most cases because the only cases that I can excuse from mediation are criminal matters. Criminal matters are the ones that I would excuse at this point from not working in mediation, but also for all the other cases that are brought for mediation, I would say that one of the clear signals that mediation may or may not work is how the parties are. How are the parties showing a willingness, first of all, to come to the mediation table? And if, for example, you see, we always say that in mediation, I think to a large extent, the mediation also depends on the mediator, how your skills yourself, eh? because if, for example, the parties are not willing to come together, maybe there is so much bitterness and there is a lack of trust between the parties. Then before you, the mediator brings the parties together, we always talk about the mediator meeting the parties individual so that you are able to assess as you meet them and you're introducing yourself. That way, depending on how you interact with the parties, then you are able to see whether there can be success in the mediation. So I would say that most of the skills which goes to the second questions, the skills for the mediator for family uh, wealth mediation are yourself, first of all, we have talked about the skills, eh? your qualifications, are you qualified? Of course, you, for you to be a mediator, you, must you have qualified as a mediator, but over and above that, have you gone to another extent of getting to know more about family mediations, what is expected of a mediator? Have you honed your skills? And also, we talked about your experience. Because for the parties to come to you, they need to have confidence that this is something that you can deal with. And that's why we were saying it's important to volunteer so that as you're volunteering, you're getting more experience in the family wealth mediation that we are talking about. But over and above that, there is something I mentioned in those qualities there, personal attributes, there is one that we are calling, we are talking about your own personal reputation. As in, what is your reputation out there? Do people look at you and see you as someone they can trust? Because trust is very key in mediation. And those are the ones that I can think about right here and now, but there are many more. There, there are many more matters that are, that, or rather many other skills that maybe we could talk about which we may need more time to look at and share with the, with the participants, other skills that one needs to make such a good mediator. And before maybe you move on, yes, I see a comment from Christine Kipsang, yes, that in criminal matters, thanks for this, Christine, that what is applied is flip again. 
which is akin to mediation. And this is where the accused person can initiate for the state authority only many criminal matters, including murder cases, except sexual offenses. So I, then I, it, it, she's also saying that sexual offenses are the ones where we completely exclude mediation. Over to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'll just give you uh, another set of, uh, of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so what can be done to have more people uh, preparing their wills in advance? Uh, what can be done to have more people preparing their wills in advance? And uh, who, who needs to play a greater role in this? Then the other question that I have for you, uh, you mentioned uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, being involved in the IP uh, uh, sector as well. Is intellectual, uh, can you inherit uh, things in the IP sector? Are those things that uh, you can include uh, in your will? Mm -hmm. So perhaps take those two. Okay. So what can be done to enable more people write their wills? I feel that what needs to be done is that we need to talk about it more. Since we are aware that there are very many people who do not make wills, we need to tell people that writing a will does not mean that you are going to die, but that in fact it shows that you are being a prudent citizen, you care for your family, and you want to give a legacy for them. So there are many fora for such. First of all, like I have seen churches, there are some churches that hold, uh, hold such meetings where they talk about wills and family successions. They call a lawyer and the lawyer comes and talks to the members. There are also many other associations, for example, in the professional associations. Of course, for lawyers, lawyers are aware. They know they should write wills, but maybe they also need to be told much more for them to know. But all the other professionals in whichever area they are, then we need to talk about it more. In the media, the media plays a key role in all these things. And we ourselves, who are the practitioners in that area, maybe we as lawyers have not talked about it. I know that, yes, we are not supposed to advertise our services and all, but whenever we have an opportunity, like me, I can say what I have been doing from the last time that we did this uh, session in March, one other place that I have gone to and talked to the people about writing wills and section planning is one of the organizations where I used to work. So I had a session and I trained the staff on the same. And people think that wills are very expensive to write. There's a friend of mine who tells me, he's a lawyer, he tells me how he publicizes like his services for this is that he goes to an association. And when he talks in that association, He's telling the people, he's just informing them that it's important for them to write wills. And so as to be able to attract many of them, you know, many people say that legal services are expensive. So he just charges a because he knows that once you come to me and I write to you a will, then that is an open point for me to be able to give you more services. So I don't need to discourage you by for writing the will. Yet I can had you a small fee for writing the will, then that's an open point for me to be, do much more for you. So who, uh, the people, I've talked about the media, I've talked about the, the church, I've talked about ourselves as lawyers and the other associations that need to talk about. And I feel that even an association like this one, Osiliana Hub and many of these other associates are good forum for people to talk about estate planning. And I've seen, of course, during this COVID situation, many of the lawyers, the law firms, have, we feel that we need to do more. Uh, you, there was also another question on who needs to prepare. The last question, please remind me, the last question you asked. Uh, the, the last question I asked was about IP. And the question was, can IP rights be inherited? There is what we call assignment of copyright. You can assign copyright and assign those rights to, to other people to take thereafter. 
where you have some of those uh, intellectual property rights, I am trying to think of a patent. Yes, I feel they can be passed on because I have seen in some of these business, uh, business, what, what do we call them? Well, business talks like we used to have the one for KCB, the Lion Den is an equivalent in the UK whereby someone can invest in a company simply because they wanted the benefit due to the intellectual property, the patent that someone has. So in the same way in a business, it can be passed on. It is also the same way it can be passed on to the beneficiaries thereafter. If they have the skills and they are able to take on the business forward, I believe that they can be passed on. Uh, thank you. Just before I, I let you go, uh, what is the implication of the Mediation Act uh, to, a media uh, to a practicing mediator? Uh, what is the implication of the current uh, Mediation Act to a practicing uh, mediator? I would say that the, that Mediation Act, of course it has been publicized the first time and people are making comments. So first and foremost, what one needs to do is to familiarize themselves with it. And because the act has not yet been passed as final, I have seen several associations, even Wasiliana have, I've also seen MTI and some other like chapters where people have chapters of mediation. They have been making their comments and sending them in the time that was there to make comments so that before the law comes into place, then we have a say in the same. Because you see, once the law it is passed, then it means that we will just have to comply. So what means is that now once the law has been passed, you have to familiarize yourself with it and to comply with it in as far as mediation is concerned. So we had an opportunity when we had that window for us to make our comments and, and contribute to how we want mediation practice to be, uh, to be operationalized in Kenya. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, do you have any personal uh, comments about it? Uh, no, I don't have a personal comment right now. Okay, okay. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I, I will invite uh, Susan Wendot. Uh, Susan Wendot will be able to give us a commentary as well. Uh, Wendot, are hello, you on? Uh, yeah. Hello, hello. Good um, evening, Susan. How are you? Fine, Nas. I'm trying to put my camera on. Okay, but we can hear you <laughs> just fine. Sorry? We can Sorry? hear you okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll make it. Thank you so much, uh, Bernice, for that. Uh, very insightful discussion. I know we've discussed before, but it's getting clearer by the day. We are getting to, to understand it better. So I'll just speak a few things that she mentioned about um, why people are not doing wills or um, just discussing their wealth with their families. I think most, most of it is uh, nature of Africans that this is what I, I looked for. Why should my children or anybody know what I've been struggling to get? I think that's what I, I guess one of the issues why they are not doing that. So um, maybe this one now calls for us to do awareness to people on uh, the need of declaring their wealth, having open discussions with their families so that they don't leave them with problems. Then the other one which I took home with from Bernice is the need to start working on um, planning our retirement, planning our uh, succession. Maybe as soon as somebody gets into employment, that's what, you, or as soon as you buy a property, one needs to think of how do you pass it on to the next uh, generation. So maybe that's something that even before somebody uh, gets married, that should be part of the marriage um, strategies to, to, to put in place and how they'll distribute that wealth. 
So I think that one came out very clearly that uh, we need we need to do that. I know in some communities there are uh, people who they 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 divide their wealth when they are still alive and they are witnesses who are elders of the village who witness and once they do that that stands there is no changing because they are doing it in in the presence of uh, witnesses um then the other one was um the alternative justice um i'm just wondering i'll still pose a question to bernice i'm just wondering how many people know or are aware about the accessibility to justice the new system that uh, is available because when people hear of a case all they know is a lawyer or an advocate so are people aware of these um, available opportunities to get access to free uh, free access to justice then uh, mediation i think is another one that we really need to do a lot of work a lot of awareness because if I approach somebody that I can mediate their case. They'll look at me first and wonder, is she a lawyer? Because they are, they are used to having lawyers sorting out their issues. So maybe that's an awareness that uh, really needs to be emphasized so that people are aware there are alternative ways of uh, uh, resolving a dispute other than litigation. So I think that one needs to be emphasized. Maybe as Wasiliana Hub, we can take it as a challenge to start educating the public about the availability of alternative dispute resolution mm -hmm. in form of uh, mediation. So I think uh, that is what I picked. Then when she talked of is succession a success in Kenya? I think I've ex I explained it's not because of the reasons that I gave earlier, that most, most people who have wealth, they don't even disclose to their family members. And that's the reason why most of it goes to Ufa, the, the unclaimed uh, financial assets authority, because it, it's, they, there is nobody who takes it. The other one was uh, the failure to write the wills. I think that one we've, we've, we cannot emphasize more because uh, most people are like, I don't want anybody to know what I have, or if I write my will, I'll go very fast. So I think those are some of the reasons that make people uh, not, to, not to write wills. I know like uh, in my community, uh, somebody feels this is my hard and uh, wealth. So why should I tell my children about it? So it becomes difficult so that when they go, uh, they leave their families with problems of uh, trying to divide those, uh, the, the wealth. Then, um, The exec okay, I wanted to ask Bernice, but I, I didn't put it down about the execution of the uh, um, um, Koinange's case. Okay, it was ruled, but has it been executed? If she's still around, she can note it somewhere. So we need to make plans in advance, involve our families in our business dealings so that you tell them I have a property here. And this is how I would want it to be to be uh, divided. And the most important, which Bernie's uh, mentioned, is keeping com communication lines in the family open, so that there is no secret. Everybody knows uh, this family member has which property and where, because, uh, like I'm told, for uh, is it Krimas and Krimas case. Most of the property went to maybe the employees, like the secretary and other employees, because it was not uh, disclosed. So, um, that's, I think that's um, 
what I captured, and then I'll mention something a, a bit on inheritance that um, why we have problems again when it comes to inheritance. It starts right from the home where the children are discriminated upon, that uh, especially for the ladies, the women, the family will be like, why, why should we give you anything and yet you are getting married, going to another family? So that is where the disputes arise, in, uh, right at the, at the family level. And, um, and most customary laws favor the men. And they are normally given the to take to be the custodians of family wealth. And the women are considered that they have married, they will get their wealth in another family. I was looking at this case, which was passed by Justice Lucy Waitaka Inyeri, uh, about a lady who was married and the brothers were like, they, they sh she should not be entitled to anything because she, she will get from where she is married. And the ruling that Lucy, uh, Justice Lucy made that, um, that she should benefit from uh, what the brothers are benefiting from, and this was mostly influenced by the new constitution, which was launched in 2010, that treats every child as a child regardless of their marit marital st status. So this, um, the, the new constitution will help maybe women to be able to inherit. But of course there will be issues when it comes to family members, even executing uh, uh, those uh, rulings. So I, I think we as Africans, as Kenyans, we still have a lot, a lot to do on when it comes to inheritance issues and also uh, maybe getting uh, the awareness or uh, people to get aware of the legal provisions that are available for them to be able to follow up uh, some of these uh, issues. And uh, the most important I think is uh, for one, when they are still alive, just to declare what they have and even dividing, if, if they are open in their communication, divide with their children what they have. So uh, that's what I picked, and uh, I think I'll end there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Susan. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Muya to be able to give uh, just some remarks uh, concerning some of the issues that uh, Wendort has raised in her commentary. Thank you, Sarah. There are two comments that she has said. The alternative justice system as to how many people are aware of it and that they can access it. I would say that I don't think too many people know, but uh, the, we still have that big responsibility of like publicizing mediation so that the parties are aware that they, their disputes can be settled. And one of the ways I propose that we can do that is, for example, talking to associations. Like, for example, why can't we as Wasiliana Habe say we are an association of mediators? And because we know like Kenya Association, you have your members, when they have dispute, we are here, we are willing and available for them to settle the disputes. And we can tell them that we can settle disputes in as far as many areas are concerned, employment, all those like the areas which we are able to help the members with. Other associations are like Aki, Association of Kenya Insurance, ESPAC, even an organization like IRA, we, who are a regulator. And I saw last week we had someone who had come from the banking association. That is also another bodies because we have to check ourselves eh? we are the ones who are who want to be known that we have the we have the skills to to mediate their disputes so we would have to take ourselves to such bodies so that they know we have mediators who can help settle even commercial disputes instead of them going to court and taking forever to be settled the other one where she wanted me to comment on was uh, 
the, like the execution of Mbiyo Kainange as a state, I think it, is, it has happened or it's in the process. I may not have the full details, but I saw that in the media there was, I know one of the beneficiaries is one, somebody in the media, um, this anchor, Jeff Koinange, I think I saw like there's something he had already inherited from this estate. So we can, I think it is there that the estate is actually being distributed. I may not have the full details, but I think I'm aware of that one. The other issues, yeah, I mostly agree with what she's saying. I think that bit of the fear that, and I think there's also this customary bit where people think that, I think I really agree with her when she's saying that some men may feel I am the one who has worked for this well. Why do I need to disclose to my people what I have worked for? There are even some people who used to say that what I have worked for is mine. I've educated you as children, go and create your own way. But yet this person will die and whatever he leaves then will be misappropriated if he does not let his children know. What she has said about, yes, inculcating these values and having this trust in the family is very important. And, and I like what she said about uh, even distributing your wealth when you are alive. There is no reason why. Of course, as per the law, as long as one is alive, the children don't have a right to eat. But who says that you have to follow the law? You have your own will that you can implement so that you can distribute your own wealth. And explain clearly to the children, I've given this to so-and-so, I've given this to so-and-so for this reason, so that even when you leave, the disputes don't come up. If they have any issues, they raise them and you're able to sort them out there and then. So I think that's a very good way of dealing with the matter. And yes, it's good that the constitution is recognizing the rights of women. I remember when he was talking about women inheriting property, and that is a big issue that our own society does not recognize the rights of women, which is a point that we need to educate the society so that they can recognize that both Male children and female children have equal rights to their parents' estate. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Banis, for that. Um, I'll just give uh, an opportunity to Mohammed to be able to make his uh, final comments. Uh, Mohammed, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to make my final comment. There's something small that I raised. Sometimes uh, when we talk about uh, tested will, uh, tested uh, succession, whereby the, the succession would be by will, and uh, sometimes uh, the, the deceased may exclude the dependent and relative completely, excluding them from, uh, from inheriting the dependent and relatives. And maybe they we may write the, the property to be given to strangers or any 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 in any other case, but all in all, he has excluded the dependent and relative completely. And uh, thus naturally will rise disputes in the end. So what will be will be your advice in such scenario? Do you have a as a, 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 a I've had uh, the, the speaker speaking about that case. Even succession, succession Bill 2019 is dealing with the same issue, somehow protecting the dependent from such kind of uh, move done by the deceased. This also may happen. So if we put this scenario in the platform, how do you deal with it? It, may, it occurs in other parts of the world. We don't know here in Kenya, but sometimes because uh, a deceased has the right to write a will, he can write and he can give his property away by once. And maybe he has dependent, dependent people who depend on that property to survive and the will has written something else. I'm understood there, please. Okay, my comment is that you see ultimately what is supreme is the law, the law of succession act. So in as much as I have the free will to write my will and to provide for whoever, even to give strangers or charities, if I have not provided for my beneficiaries or if I have not provided for them adequately, 
then they have a right to go to court and challenge a will. That's why we say that even when you have written a will, there is still that opportunity for it to be challenged in court. So ultimately, the court is the one that then decides what should, as in that all beneficiaries should be provided for at the end of the day. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, most appreciated, uh, Mohammed, uh, uh, Ms. Moya, and uh, Windot. Uh, I'll give an opportunity to Wangari to be able to make some comments uh, before we uh, are able to conclude in just a little while. Uh, Wangari, please. Thank you very much, Sarah. I wish to thank you for uh, uh, hosting us and also for um, guiding us. And um, uh, I thank Bernice uh, Muya, um, uh, most especially because uh, this is actually a rerun. Uh, we had this session in the month of March, and the message continued to resonate uh, for us as practicing mediators. And we hope that um, uh, an even wider audience now um, has the opportunity to be able to share the message. Um, my comments on, in this area uh, is that uh, for mediators, this is a very um, important area for us, an area which we view that mediators can be able to provide some uh, very high level value to not only Kenya, um, but also to families. We are very um, aware that families are unique. Just as like if you have um, one hand and another hand, families are very unique. And families run on emotion. They are relational. Businesses, on the other hand, you find that they are transactional. And so when we talk about the area that relates to family wealth, because business is also one of the elements, or businesses are one of the elements that uh, come into the uh, the context when it comes to the issues of discussing inheritance and succession, we find that sometimes we do have a clash of this. One is coming from emotions, the other one is coming from um, a rational or transactional um, context. And that's where we really see that mediators are able to provide very high value, and that is why we actually refer to mediators in this segment, not only just as family wealth mediators, but we are looking at how we grow into family business and also family wealth um, consultants. So we hope that mediators, after listening to this and also your own experiences that you have had, if you're serving with the court or you have done uh, matters uh, privately, that you will join us in this movement of being able to develop competent family wealth mediators. When uh, Madame Bani speaks about 500 billion that's seated in the courts or that is held uh, within the courts or the, um, the court hands, we should ask ourselves, what does it take for us as mediators to actually be able to work with these families? Because they are not those people's families, they are actually our own families. When we take in mediation into the family wealth conversation, we bring in the beauty of mediation, which is to always help to deconstruct we help families to deconstruct what is the problem. And then at the same time, we are able to bring in now elements that help them to be able to have a wider picture of the direction that they would like to see their families going. When we speak that we are uh, developing family wealth mediators, some of the things that we are uh, working with now, the mediators who uh, uh, opt in for the family wealth uh, mediation uh, program, is how to be able to uh, engage with families in the development of family constitutions. Family constitutions is one of the set agreements that help families to be able to lay down rules that enable them to progress from one generation in with wealth um, into the next. Again, as you engage uh, with, in the family wealth conversations, you discover that there are also other tools families can work with. Families that especially are running, uh, that have businesses, can actually have family councils. The family council then becomes the intermediary between the family and the family business, so that then you're not having children having to go and now uh, uh, go directly, let's say it's like the CEO who's employed into the business. And with that, then it means that the, the first generation of a family business or the first generation of the wealth, they are able to 
be able to pass on to their family a business or properties that are actually in a better and organized way. We did ask mediators when you're signing up uh, in terms of whether yourself or, or someone you know has been involved in a matter that relates to uh, property or that relates generally to uh, family wealth and uh, family wealth related disputes. While we have about 80%, when we have 80, about 80% of us who participate in this um, uh, conversation saying yes, it means that yet again, this is not a conversation about those people who are out there that we mediate for, but it is a conversation that is actually in our homes. And it means that we have the opportunity to even kickstart right there. We view that family wealth mediation uh, transformed from just being a regular mediation. It can actually provide um, a, a, a line of mediation by which mediators can be able to not only specialize, but they can actually uh, run it as a fee-based service. So as mediators, what did we say when we are uh, uh, in our responses as to whether we think that mediation is the preferred way uh, for families? And most of us say it is not uh, the preferred way. And we say that it is not uh, the preferred way for families because it is not what is presented first to them, uh, even uh, uh, based on what they know. The judiciary also should act as a first line by presenting uh, mediation on any of the family wealth matters uh, first. Again, there's a need for uh, publicizing of mediation. Then uh, uh, there's a comment that there's need for support by the legal counsel so that there can be increased awareness of mediation. So the conversation rotates around a need for awareness. Uh, uh, Bani Suya has mentioned that we are the ones, or I will rephrase it, that we as the mediators are the ones to enable families or persons who can access our services to be able to know that this mediation is an option and mediation is actually a tool that they could actually be able to use and that we are actually there as mediators. So mediators, I encourage you, family wealth mediation is actually an area that mediators, we can strengthen ourselves and be able to make a difference in families, be able to make a difference uh, in our nation. And it can actually be a line that uh, some of the mediators could actually choose uh, to opt in. So I thank you uh, also, uh, young mediator, uh, Mohammed Said for your opening commentary and uh, also for uh, your good reminder of the United Nations Peace Day, which was uh, on Monday. It was hosted on the 23rd of September. Once again, thank you, Madam Banis, for uh, taking us through this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Vidita Sara Kerr, for your uh, moderation of this session. And colleagues, I look forward to our further engagement in other sessions. Thank you very much and God bless you. Back to you, Vidita Sara. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Wangari. Um, it has been a good uh, engagement as uh, we have been able to see from many of the comments. Uh, Banis, I'm sure you have seen uh, quite a number of people appreciate uh, the insights that you have been able to share with us uh, uh, today. Uh, it is a little bit difficult to close, but I think we will need to uh, call uh, it uh, to a close today. Uh, and I will just invite uh, Banis for the very last comment, and then we will be able to close. Uh, in, in giving your last comment, Banis, you might take the question uh, which asks, what happens when a sibling does not honor the will of the parent, yet the sibling is married? And uh, with that, we will be able to close. Welcome, Banis. Thank you. Uh, the question on what happens if a sibling does not honor the will of the parents, yet he or she is married. Uh, I don't see where the, the issue of the person being married, could it be that it has to do with property and the parents have decided maybe this property will go to so and so. Maybe if that's the case then, and the sibling does not wish to honor that, then I think mediation is the best way to go, whereby instead of rushing to go to, to court, why don't you look for like relatives? You see, for example, it's your family. Maybe you have uncles who are able to talk to you as a family so that then they are able to speak to you and be able to help you come to 
an agreement on how the property is to be distributed or how the parents' wishes are to be honored. Because ultimately, the parents' wishes need to be honored because they had good reasons why they wanted things to be distributed the way they wanted. So that would be my comment. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It has been a great engagement. I've enjoyed myself presenting. And thank you also for your engagement. You know, the questions that you've asked, what you've shared, Muhammad, and also Sarah, and even Wangari. So it's a good engagement. We need to keep on uh, engaging so that we are able to help each other to move forward. And I believe that, like we've said, it's only we ourselves who can limit us to how far we can go. The, the way is open for us. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moya. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of uh, our seminar this afternoon. Uh, we have been looking at inheritance and uh, succession plan, asking the question whether succession is a success in Kenya. I think what we have been able to see is that there is lots of opportunity uh, for using mediation to be able to enable the success of succession uh, in Kenya. Uh, so I hope we will all uh, work together, as we have said, towards creating awareness uh, uh, with what we can be able to do uh, with mediation. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohamed Said, for the commentary. Thank you very much, Susan Windot, uh, for the commentary. Thank you very much, our speaker this uh, afternoon, evening, uh, Banis uh, Muya. I have been your moderator, Sarah Atar, and I wish you all a very good evening. We conclude with the words of the national anthem in English. O oh God of all creation, Bless this, our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. God bless you. <laughs>